The fear of needing significant capital often holds many aspiring investors back from buying their first apartment building, leaving them stuck in financial limbo. Facing the daunting prospect of securing funding without having deep pockets seems impossible, which fuels anxiety about missing out on lucrative opportunities. In this video, we'll break down the strategies that we use to just buy an apartment building this year with no money down, providing you with a clear roadmap to overcome financial barriers and start building your real estate portfolio. Let's dive in. My name is Stacy, and welcome to the RMFI Academy, where we empower working professionals to achieve financial autonomy through multifamily investing. All right, no matter what, it's not about, oh, it's a very special property that we can do no money down on. It's more of a mindset. Creative financing, no money down, is a way to get creative about how to structure a deal. So you always have to do the exact same things, the exact same research that you would do for a no money down deal as you would for a deal that you are putting down significant capital. You need to research the market. You need to make sure that that market is one that's gonna be good to hold property in long term. And I had a whole nother video about researching markets that you can go and watch. So you're researching markets and you're building a team and then you're evaluating deals and you evaluate the deals the exact same way, whether you're the one putting in the money or whether you're gonna bring in some partners to do the deal with you. All right, so let's talk about like, what does that look like in real life? So earlier this year, we closed on a 13 unit apartment building that also had 20 storage units. How much money did I put into it? Zero, not a penny. And let me explain how that worked out. Well, for starters, where we selected the market was in an area that we had researched, we like what's going on in the area, and we would like to hold property long-term there. So we still did the same thing that we would do if we were putting down 100, 200, $300,000 on a property. The fact that we're financing it, no money down, had nothing to do with that part. Then we got the deal and we analyzed the deal in depth. And what we found is, wow, not only is this a really good stabilized cash flow deal, there is actually a little bit of upside because there's a few things that the seller didn't do that he could do that would increase the net operating income. Okay, so everything is the same as any other deal. Now. This one is actually even more interesting because this deal was a seller finance deal. So let's just talk a little bit about this because you know sometimes people think, well, I can have it be either seller finance and I put money down or I can have a regular bank and bring in partners, but I can't do both. And that's not true, you can do both. And that's exactly what we did on this property. So seller financing, what does that even mean? So when a seller owns a property outright and doesn't have a mortgage on it and they sell it to you, if they want, they can effectively be the bank. So in this example, and this deal was found through a real estate broker, through the same way we find most of our properties, through the relationships we build with brokers in the different markets that we work in. So the seller was 89 years old. He owned actually multiple businesses, super sharp guy, but he's just looking at the reality of his age and he wants to start preparing all of his businesses and his trust to make sure that they are ready to be able to be passed down to his family. Okay. So he owns the property. There's no mortgage on it. And when we talked to him, we said, well, tell us a little bit about what you're looking to do here. So he wasn't willing to carry a hundred percent of the financing, which that would also be no money down. So if a seller says, sure, if you're going to buy it for me for 705,000, which is what we bought it for, that's technically possible though, highly unlikely. So don't get your hopes up on that. But if they said, I don't need anything down. I just want a monthly payment. Technically that is a possibility. In this case, he said, I'd be willing to carry the financing if you put down 25%. So we had to put down 25% of $705,000. So that doesn't sound like no money down. Well, again, real estate is not no money down, but I'm the purchaser of the property. Was I able to do it with no money down? Yes. So that was the very first part. I got 75% of the purchase price provided by the seller. And it's the seller instead of Bank of America or some other bank the seller is effectively acting as the bank. All right, so what about the 25% down? And plus, besides the down payment, what are the other costs that we're gonna incur? Well, we're gonna have due diligence, we're gonna have closing costs. If you're using a regular bank, you would also have financing costs. In this case, it was direct to seller, so we didn't have that. But no matter what, there is gonna be a chunk of capital you need. So that first amount, that first 25% down for that deal was like $176,000, all right? That's not no money, right? But what did I do to fund it and to fund the rest? So this deal, I knew 
I have an investor friend that they sold their business, they have some capital, and they love the idea of holding long-term multifamily real estate and getting that passive income. So, and I have a few friends like that, but they were the first ones that I went to because they've invested in several of our deals as passive investors. And I said, hey, are you guys interested in taking a look at this? So not only did we need the 25% down, but we also wanted to have a $50,000 rehab reserve because several of the units had people living in them that had been there for a long time. And we knew that there was gonna probably be some repairs that were gonna need to be done and we wanted to make sure we had enough money set aside. So we went to our partners and said, look, in order to have all the money we need to close the deal and for all of the costs and for the rehab, we need X amount of money. And it was 270,000 was the total amount. So they said, hmm, well, what would the returns be? So we calculated and showed them, this is what the returns would be. This would be the percentage of the deal that you would own. And this would be the percentage of the deal that we would own. It's a joint venture, which means everybody who's in the deal is responsible for the deal. But in this particular case, we are the ones that are doing the majority of the work. Their primary role is funding the deal, but they're still involved. They still have a role. They still have voting rights. So they put up all of the money for the deal and we closed, which means I now own a 13 unit apartment building with 20 storage units that provides cash flow every single month. And I didn't have to put any money into it. Now, I am not saying that you should always try to do no money down. I like to do it every once in a while because it's fun to see, well, how creative can we get to get ownership of more things without putting capital? Most deals we're putting capital in, but it's not required. That it's just really important that you, when you're getting started, that you don't be limited in your mind by this resource that you feel is outside your reach. It doesn't have to be your money. Think about who's out there working that might have capital, right? So you have busy executives. Well, what is the key word there? Busy. They're too busy to go find the deals and negotiate them and crunch the numbers and do the due diligence and manage the asset. But they like the idea of real estate. Most people do. Most people know that millionaires are made on real estate investing. So you are effectively providing a service to them by being the one who brings the deal and who's basically gonna do the majority of the work. All you need is the one thing that they can easily contribute, because it's not time, but they can contribute money. And that gives them a return on their capital and allows you to fund the deal. Another thing you can do that can get you pretty close to no money down is doing what's called a master lease. And I'll give you an example of this. One of my students from a handful of years ago bought a nine unit property in West Palm Beach, Florida, and the seller also did seller financing. All right, so that was nine units. She ended up turning it into an Airbnb. So she has nine Airbnb units in a property, but she could have also just turned it into a regular rental and hold it as a cash flow property. But she's used to doing Airbnb, likes that active strategy and did that. Well, that same seller, once she kind of got settled with that property, basically offered to let her come in for the property across the street that he also owned and to do a master lease. So what does that mean? So what that means is every month you have to pay me $25,000 and you basically have full control of the building. You can operate it however you want. So the more profitable you make it, the more money you'll make. But no matter what, I get my $25,000. So that's a master lease because that student basically has a lease with the owner and then all of the tenants have a lease now with her. That's called a master lease option. So you could technically get in with no money down if the person who's offering the master lease doesn't require um, like option consideration if it was a lease option um, or some kind of you know good faith money. But if they do require that, then again, the same principle applies. You can bring in a joint venture partner to fund that portion of the deal. So a lot of times people say, well, where am I supposed to find these people with money? There's a lot of different ways to find them. And you have to understand that it does take time to build. Now in our academy, the students who are finding deals are frequently just finding partners within the academy. Well, why is that? Well, because they are part of an environment where they're getting to know each other. Everybody is learning and growing and buying more and more properties, but they're developing a personal relationship around a business where everyone has the same goals. So anytime you can get yourself into an environment with like-minded people who want to do what you're doing, that's a great way to start. So being in an environment with other people who want to do what you're doing, but you're the one who's actually doing it. You're the one investing your time and your energy, potentially your money and learning and being coached. 
they need what you have. Another thing that you can do nowadays is there are Facebook groups. There are Facebook groups that you can go to where there are other people who are trying to do what you're doing. Being vocal on Facebook about what you're up to, like what you're studying, what properties you're looking at, will start letting everyone around you know, this is what I'm up to. Most people probably won't say anything, but there are gonna be some people in your network that go, well, wait a second. So what are you doing? You're doing real estate investing? I've always wanted to get into that. And people are always surprised when they start doing these posts like I teach them, wow, people are coming out of the woodwork. And they are because everybody, generally speaking, knows that real estate is the best way to build long-term sustainable wealth. So when they see you're in it and you're doing it and they are interested at all, they're gonna reach out to you. All of them are potential partners. It does take time to nurture those relationships. So make sure you give it the time that it needs. All right, now let's talk a little bit about structuring partnerships. So every time that we do any kind of joint venture partnership, we always do it within an LLC, right? A limited liability company. And we have an attorney that we've been working with for 10 years, Anderson Business Advisors, and they always create our LLCs for us. So within an LLC, there's something called an operating agreement. So the LLC is the is the entity, it's the legal structure. The operating agreement is multiple pages that basically say, this is what this company is about. These are the people or the companies that are involved in this legal entity. This is the ownership. It also outlined who, who's doing what, who's responsible for what, who's running what roles, who's gonna be filing the tax return, who's managing the asset. So your operating agreement is a very important, important, important piece for outlining everything you always want to make sure that whatever you've discussed or whatever's in your head is also on paper. And that is the best thing that you can do to be long-term successful. I know this is a lot to learn. And listen, I want to let you know that we've provided a free resource for you. If you go to www.warriorsofwealth.com, that is a website that we've put eight of our free masterclasses on. Now, I handpicked those masterclasses because we've probably done 30 of them, but I picked the top eight that I feel are best for new apartment investors to really understand the whole thing. So that's our gift to you. You can go there, fill out your information, and you'll get access and you can have them for life. Go ahead and Netflix and binge. Let's just talk for a minute about negotiating with your joint venture partners. Like when you're underwriting your deal and you're seeing this is how much the deal provides, this is how much the property will provide as far as income, cash flow, etc. And when you're coming up with the splits, the partnership splits, how much are you going to own? How much are the partner or the partners going to own? The whole thing that you have to figure out is what is that balance that gives you enough financial reward to make it worth it for you to do it? Keeping in mind, you don't have any money into it, right? But it's still worth your time. And you have to make sure that there's enough of a return for the people putting all the money into the deal that that's a good use of their money and that serves their needs. So it always comes back to understanding what is it that your partners are looking for? Because frankly, if you're, you're running your numbers on a deal and you can see that it's only gonna provide a 5% cash on cash return and you know that that investor wants a minimum of seven or 8%, you're not gonna be able to take as big a cut because they're not gonna accept 5%, which means nobody's gonna do the deal. So you just have to find that middle ground, play with your numbers through your underwriting and figure out what's gonna be enough to attract a joint venture partner, but still leave enough to make it worth your time. All right, I already gave you my example of that most recent 13 unit. Let me give you another example of someone from our academy. And this deal closed literally two weeks before my 13 unit closed, and it was a 48 unit. We are actually partners in that 48 unit with them. We did some capital raising, but let me help you understand. So Rachel and Liz, two of our students, they partnered together to do the deal. Now, it was a $5 million purchase price, almost. Right. So the down payment and the amount of capital needed, it was substantial. It was over $2 million. Well, they don't have $2 million just sitting around because basically they're on property number six and seven. They've bought a bunch of properties. They did have capital when they started, but they used it all. So you might be starting out with not a lot of capital. You're in the same position as them who've already done multiple deals, but they used their capital, right? So they're doing the same thing. So when a raise is that large, you have two options when it comes to raising capital for your deal. You're either gonna do a joint venture partnership, which is basically you have a handful of people who are all gonna be active in the deal in some way, putting their money together and doing the deal together. There's no rule or law about how many people can be in a joint venture. 
However, I've talked to many attorneys over the years and the overall sentiment is that there really needs to be five or fewer people in a joint venture to not kind of raise the eyebrow of the SEC. Okay, so, but let's say there's 15 people that you need to fund a deal. Well, the way the SEC is gonna look at that, they're gonna say, really? You have 15 different people who all have active roles in the property? I doubt it. So joint venture is typical when you start off and you're doing you know, five, 10, 15, sometimes 20, 25 units. If the down payment is a few hundred thousand dollars, then you can typically fund it with a handful of people as long as they have, you know, chunks of capital to put in. But when you start getting into larger and larger properties, that's when you move into something that's called syndication. Syndication can also allow it to be a no money down situation for you. It doesn't mean there's no money because in this case of the 48 unit, it's $2 million that's needed, but it didn't have to be Liz and Rachel's money. Now, the big difference between a joint venture and a syndication is that in a joint venture, everyone is active. In a syndication, all of the investors are passive. They don't have voting rights about the operations. They're not involved in the operations. Their only role is to write a check and give it to the operating team, the general partnership, and the general partners then go and operate the building based on the business plan that they had described or explained to the investors putting money into the deal. So in this particular case, Rachel and Liz had a 48 unit property. It didn't require them to put any of their own capital in. They basically just said, we have this deal. It's fantastic. And it was, it was a great cash flow deal. It was going to be a seven year hold and they had agency financing, which without a doubt is probably the most desirable financing because you can get a longer amortization period. You can get a fixed rate. There's a lot of benefits to it and it can be non-recourse. We can talk about that another time. So in this case, they ran it as a syndication. So there were a whole bunch of investors who said, I'm interested in that deal, but I don't have the time nor do I have the desire to go be a part of making decisions about what we should rehab and where we should raise rents and lease renewals and all of that, right? That's going to be Rachel and Liz's primary role is operating the building. Now this doesn't mean that they're there doing it, right? They're asset managing. There is an actual property management company that's local in the market. Liz and Rachel live in Arizona and California. The property's in Missouri, so they're nowhere near it. Liz and Rachel work with them to make sure that they are executing the business plan. They did have a lot of investor friends that they were able to present the deal to, but they didn't have so many that they were able to fund the deal and they knew that going in. So they partnered with another person that was Jen, oh, me and Jen. So we're able to reach out to our investor database and say, we have a great deal. If you're interested in a long-term buy and hold that has a really solid cash on cash return and upside at the end of seven years, you want to take a look at this deal. So we came in as a partner, Jen and I, with our capital company and we raised about a million dollars, a little bit more than that. So Liz and Rachel needed to just go get the other million. We combined it and that is the general partnership. So Jen and I are in that. We raised capital for it. We're involved in investor relations and also advising about the operations of the property. Liz and Rachel are doing all of the operations. So as you can see, it's really more of a mindset than anything. It's not about the property and it's not about the investor. It's about how do you bring this together? And if you can teach yourself to have the mindset of, Anytime there's a deal, if it's a good deal, I'm going to go find the money. It's okay if it's other people's money, because frankly, you're helping them. You're doing a service to them as well. Now that you know how to buy your first apartment building with no money down, let's help you understand how to find the right property, how to manage it and what major pitfalls to avoid. I made a whole video series, go deeper onto each one of these subjects. Just click that video that's in your screen right now and I'll see you there.